Right, good morning, everybody. Well, good afternoon if you're in the UAE. Welcome to the first UAE UK Business Council Innovation Working Group webinar. My name is Omar Hassan, uh, founder of Global Growth Hub, which is an economic development consultancy and the MENA Technology Fund. The MENA Technology Fund is a $50 million uh, fund investing in early stage technology across the Middle East and Africa, in particular digital health, education and agriculture and food. So this webinar is of particular interest to us. Um, um, we've got a couple of speakers for you today, so it should be an amazing session. First, um, a series of keynote speakers um, who you'll hear from now, who will give you an overview of kind of the work we're doing between the UAE and the UK and the importance of our bilateral relationships. And then we'll go hand over to Ray, who will take us through two panels that will give us an overview of kind of innovation uh, being used in this space, both from a corporate perspective, startups and SMEs between the UK and the UAE. So we'll kick things off with our first speaker. Um, if you don't know him, his name is Lord Edward Lister. Lord Lister is the co-chair of the UAE UK Business Council, also chairman of Homes of England since June 2016. Lord Lister has held many roles across government, um, Chief, Chief of Staff for Mayor of London, uh, for when Boris Johnson was Mayor of London, uh, Deputy Mayor for Policy and Planning at City Hall. Um, he's currently also the Director uh, of, at Covent Garden Market Authority and Governor of Museum of England. Lord Lister. Thank, thank, thanks, thanks very much. Um, uh, one correction, I'm, I'm no longer anything to do with Homes England. That was a, I left them a long time ago when I went to Downing Street and then, um, but then that's, uh, that's all past. Look, I, I'm delighted to welcome you all to this important webinar on food waste. Um, and it's hosted jointly by the UAE UK Business Council in partnership with the Emirates Society. And I'm really grateful to the Business Innovation Working Group for, for planning the whole event. The UAE UK Business um, Council acts as a thought leadership forum, bringing together business leaders and academics to identify new areas of collaboration and partnership between the two countries. And we work very, very closely with both the UAE um, Embassy in London and the British um, embassies, both in Dubai and in Abu Dhabi. And I, I'm really grateful that uh, uh, the um, the UAE ambassador to the UK is actually listening in on this call because without the support of the embassies, um, we wouldn't be able to do um, half of what we're able to do, um, which, is, which is really great. I work very closely with my co-chair, His Excellency Ahmed Al Sayah, and we are a connector um, between the business community and the government, supporting policymakers in creating the right enabling um, environment for companies particularly in the dynamic and fast-growing sectors such as agri-tech, to exchange ideas, new innovations. And of course, this is also important in the light of the forthcoming um, negotiations um, on, on an FTA, which are, are coming up in the, in the near future. Food security and food waste have long been issues of great concern globally, but the concern has intensified over the last year as a result of the pandemic and the increasing impact of global change. Global food supply chains have been disrupted uh, and crop yields have suffered um, across the world as everybody sought to adapt to COVID. I am absolutely certain that food waste will feature in COP26, which the UK is hosting in Glasgow at the beginning of November. Um, which you will hear more detail from our speakers today. If you classified food waste as a country, um, it would be the world's third largest emitter of CO2 after China and the US. Not a, not a great story. Technology and innovation will undoubtedly be the solution to addressing the food waste challenge, as well as boosting food security, so that nearly one billion people who currently go very hungry have a more reliable supply of food in the future. Some of the world's most innovative and exciting agri-tech companies have come out of the UK and UAE, UAE in recent years. And I hope that today's event will help to identify new areas where we can work together. Um, we have both large corporates, such as Sainsbury's and Bayer, 
and smaller companies such as Winnow, Seafood Soup and AEH Innovative Hydrogel presenting today. The trade relationship between the UK and the UAE last year was worth over just over 15 billion. This is a drop of 3 billion on the previous year due to the disruptions caused by COVID. But I am very confident that we can hit our stated target of 25 billion within a few years. The growth, though, will not come, however, simply by increasing volumes of exports in our traditional industries. It will come from technology driven, innovative companies, many of which are SMEs, that are seeking to address some of the critical issues that the world faces today, of which food security and waste are two of the most important. Once again, thank you very much. A big thank you to the two embassies and very much looking forward to hearing from the speakers. Lord Lister, thank you. Um, I wanna go now to Nejla. I've known Nejla for a number of years and, you know, and I, I couldn't be happier to be working with her on, in this group. Nejla Midfa is the Chief Executive Officer for Charge Entrepreneurship Center. It's a government entity launched in 2016 with a mandate to build an entrepreneurial ecosystem in Sharjah and support entrepreneurs as they build and grow innovative startups. Not only that, Nejla is also on the board of United Arab Bank and Emirates Development Bank. She's a member of the board of directors at Dana Gas and Emirates School Establishment. Nejla is also the chair of the Fourth Industrial Revolution Group here at the UAE UK Business Council. Um, Nejla, I'll hand over to you. Thank you so much, Omar, for the warm introduction. And uh, Lord Lister, thank you for the introduction to UUBC. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to join you today as we discuss one of the world's most pressing problems and showcase innovative solutions for a brighter and more sustainable future. Allow me to begin with a brief introduction about Sharai. As Omar mentioned, we are a government-supported entity that empowers entrepreneurs to build ventures that address today's societal, economic and environmental challenges. We do all this in Sharjah, one of the seven emirates in the UAE. Sharjah has established itself as a leading hub for education and is home to over 30,000 university students. Being located at the heart of this critical mass of talent has put Sharjah in the unique position to lead Sharjah's efforts to build a world-class startup ecosystem that produces globally competitive high-impact ventures. Over the past five years, we have incubated over 114 startups that have gone on to raise over $87 million in investment, created over 1,300 jobs, and generated over $130 million in revenue. Returning to today's topic, let me set the scene for you with a few staggering statistics. In a world where over 800 million people go hungry each year, we waste an enormous amount of food on a global scale. A third of all food produced ends up being wasted, and this costs the global economy more than $1 trillion annually. Here in the MENA region, reports show that we waste up to 250 kilograms per capita a year of food. And when it comes to the UAE, food waste sets us back an average of $3.5 billion every year with an average person wasting around 197, kilo, uh, sorry, 197 kilograms of food per year. We take heart, however, in the knowledge that food waste is a prominent fixture on our sustainability agenda. We saw our increasing concern turn into action with the launch of the UAE Food Bank in 2017 under the umbrella of the Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum Global Initiatives. The UAE Food Bank is committed to distributing food to those in need while eliminating food waste by collaborating with local authorities as well as local and international charities to create a comprehensive ecosystem to efficiently store, package and distribute excess fresh food from hotels, restaurants and supermarkets. The UAE's hospitality sector, which contributes to over 30% of all food waste, is specifically stepping up its efforts <clears throat> with the key players in the industry taking up the UAE Food Waste Pledge to fight food waste in their kitchens. In addition, a wave of innovation has swept the country with new developments in sustainable, and food, produ sustainable food production and waste management. 
At Shara, we have witnessed firsthand the appetite for innovation and investment in this arena. When we launched a competition last year for agri-tech, agri-food tech startups from around the world. I want to take a moment to share some of the creative solutions that came our way. Now, I'm sure that many of us covet our morning coffees, but when was the last time any one of us spared a thought about what we would do with the used coffee grounds? An Egyptian startup called Cup devised a waste, waste collection system to collect used coffee grounds, utilizing them to cultivate natural food products such as mushrooms. So can you imagine the next time you dig into a steak with mushroom sauce, that the mushrooms came straight out of the imagination of a couple of change makers. The startup has successfully partnered with giants such as Dunkin' Donuts and Costa Coffee, and has expanded into providing more quality agricultural products through food waste collection. Returning back to Sharjah, we saw dynamic solutions for tackling food waste in the airline industry. One of our Shira graduates, called The Concept, created an in-flight smart tray which uses IoT technology to collect data on how much food passengers eat when they fly. So when you are eating your in-flight meal, a chip in the tray is recording exactly what you ordered and how much of your food you left behind. Recording food preferences helps the airline uh, industry reduce food, food waste, an issue that costs the industry around $3.9 billion every year. The concept recently secured a pilot with Ittihad Airways to develop and implement their solution, so keep an eye out for a smart tray on your next flight. We know that what we are looking at is a long and challenging road ahead when it comes to reducing food waste, especially with the added challenge of the COVID-19 pandemic. However, our entrepreneurs give us hope continuing to impress us year after year with their ideas and innovations. The future will, will seem, <clears throat> the future will seem, see them continue to play a key role in meeting the UAE's food waste reduction goals. Before I wrap up, I would like to take this opportunity to personally invite each and every one of you to join us later this year at the Sharjah Entrepreneurship Festival, taking place November 22nd and 23rd. The event is a rich opportunity for businesses and startups from the UK to collaborate with their counterparts in the UAE to exchange ideas and share expertise across a variety of different sectors. Once again, thank you all for your time and enjoy the rest of the seminar. Nezla, thank you so much. <clears throat> and it's amazing what Charge has achieved in the last four years, five years, and can't wait to see the rest of what's going to happen over the next few years. Thank you. Um, to our next speaker, I'm delighted to in introduce Lord Richard Benyon. Um, Lord Benyon was appointed Parliamentary Under Secretary for State, uh, of State at the Department of in for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs um, since on May 13th, 2021. Prior to that, Richard Benyon was a Parliamentary Under Secretary for State for Natural Environment, Water and Rural Affairs from May 2010 to October 2013. Lord Benyon, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Uh, no, it's a delight to, to be here. Salam Aleikum. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. It's very, uh, it's very good to be on such a huge call with uh, so many um, real influencing uh, people in this very key area. Uh, I may sound a little bit parochial when I'm talking about what's happening in the UK, but it, it is very much within the construct of a, a, a global food industry and one that we need to influence very dramatically uh, and I think where there can be an enormous amount of synergy between UAE and uh, and the United Kingdom. In, in the United Kingdom at the moment uh, a number of planets are aligning. Uh, it, some of it is driven by Brexit, some of it by the climate and, and some of it by a new determined drive towards well-being. We recently passed uh, an Agriculture Act. We are in the process of passing an Environment Bill. Uh, we have our drive towards net zero and COP26. And we have, as a result of COVID, a new determination to tackle a very se severe problem in the UK, which is poor diet uh, and obesity. And the thread running through all of these is how we treat and manage our waste. Uh, any historian, I think that looks back on UK policy at this time, will say this was the first moment uh, that the UK absolutely grasped the breadth and, the, and the encompassed such broad 
a broad palette uh, of issues and areas. Let me just set this in context. Uh, we, uh, we want the entire food supply chain to help deliver a, uh, a healthier diet, healthier food, and encourage healthier eating. We need to ensure that our food systems are sustainable and resilient, uh, which deliver for people, for nature, and the climate. And we want a farming sector producing healthy food farming for consumption sector. at home and abroad, where all farmers have the opportunity to be rewarded for maintaining and enhancing the natural environment, for reducing carbon emissions, and improving the health and welfare of farmed animals across the whole uh, farmed countryside. We also want to deliver a landscape and ecosystem recovery uh, through long-term land, uh, land use change projects. Uh, and that is one of the reasons why uh, we uh, asked the food entrepreneur, Henry Dimbleby, who uh, to, to lead an independent review of the food system, which will inform a government food strategy, which will be published uh, later this, uh, in, within the next six months. He uh, is also the lead non-executive director of the department of which, in which I'm a minister. The scope of this review and subsequent white paper covers the entire food chain, uh, from field to fork, the production, marketing, processing, sale, purchase of food, the consumption of it, both in, in the home and out of it, uh, the consumer practices, resources, and institutions involved in that process, and of course, waste. Uh, to that end, our food strategy white paper will build on existing policy work, such as developed under the Agriculture Act and the Obesity Strategy, and to help ensure that our food system delivers healthy and affordable food for all people and is built upon resilient and a resilient and sustainable agriculture sector. And so this will encompass agricultural reforms aiming to support farming practices to create a thriving biodiverse countryside with cleaner air and water. Agriculture accounts for around 10% of the UK's uh, total greenhouse gas emissions and emissions from methane uh, make up over half of agriculture's greenhouse gas emissions. Since 1990, emissions from agriculture have reduced by 13%, uh, but it's important that we do more. I hope you can hear me above the sound of heavy machinery outside my window, but I'll, I'll press on. Uh, the Clean Growth Strategy and 25-Year Environment Plan set out a range of specific commitments to further reduce emissions from agriculture. Um, and the Net Zero Strategy, which will be published ahead of COP26 later this year, will outline pathways for each sector to de decarbonize. We're already aware of the great efforts uh, that have been made in the UK to, to reduce on-farm waste, but we're also aware there is a lot more that we can do. Uh, we want to work closely with everybody in the agriculture and the agri-food chain at home and abroad to minimize on-farm waste. And we want to see further investment and uptake in new technology. For reducing waste in the supply chain, we, we support something called the Cortel 2025 Voluntary Agreement, uh, which is promoted by uh, our government private partnership, which is called the Waste Resources Action Program. And that looks to reduce food waste by 20% by 2025. Action uh, here is primarily through a roadmap called the Food Waste Reduction Roadmap and something called the Target Measure Act approach, where businesses are set a reduction target, uh, where they measure food waste and then act to reduce it. This is currently uh, voluntary, but we will consult this year on the detail of a proposed regulation which might make the transparent reporting of food waste mandatory uh, for businesses of an, of, an, of an appropriate size. It was launched in, 20, uh, in 2018. The Food Waste Reduction Roadmap encompasses the entire supply chain from field to fork, and it sets out a clear direction for all large businesses in the UK, what they need to achieve in order for us to achieve SDG 1, SDG 12.3, uh, and provides a basis to track progress. 
It promotes Target Measure Act as a key tool to help businesses reduce waste by setting targets, measuring their food waste, and then acting on it. Reducing food waste will mitigate against climate change uh, and protect biodiversity. And that stark statistic that Eddie Lister quoted earlier is one that absolutely is in our heads. Uh, for instance, reducing food waste will mean that we use less water and land uh, for an end product uh, that is wasted. 25 to 30% of global greenhouse gases come from the food system alone. So this is a real important uh, driver. We are committed, as I say, to meeting the UN Sustainable Development Goal 12.3 target, uh, which seeks to halve global food waste at consumer and retail levels and reduce food losses along the supply chain by 20. Muted. Can you hear me? We can hear you now. Apologies. Okay. Um, uh, as you know, the food system is uh, is global. We need to ensure that our food systems are sustainable, that they're resilient, and they deliver for people uh, the nature and climate, as I said earlier. Uh, we are introducing world-leading uh, due diligence legislation through the Environment Bill to tackle I I illegal deforestation. And this is this might sound unconnected to, to, to food and, and waste, but it is absolutely fundamental, as, as I'm sure you will know. Uh, deforestation is uh, part of the global uh, UK supply chain problem, and it's one that we have a wider package of measures to improve the sustainability of our supply chains and will contribute to global efforts to protect forests and other ecosystems. And you'll see this is absolutely key part of our COP26 uh, plan. And as president of COP26, we are convening an unprecedented global dialogue on trade in forest and agricultural commodities, uh, working with producer and consumer countries to discuss and agree uh, an inclusive vision and an effective roadmap for, for, for global action. And I, I'll finish by, by just talking about one issue which, uh, which Najla and Eddie Lister have both touched on, which is of course technology. That there's a sweet spot in achieving uh, low food, lower food miles, and therefore lower carbon uh, and greenhouse gas emissions, a healthier diet uh, and producing products that, uh, that keep, keep people healthy and live longer, better lives, and a food system that doesn't damage uh, the environment, uh, and that is low waste, both on farm and at the end of shelf life. And that sweet spot can be achieved uh, through the help of technology. I'll give you one example. Uh, last week, I met a, a vertical farming company uh, called Grow Up, who have ambitions to completely uh, d disrupt the uh, current uh, import heavy uh, basis of, a, uh, of the leafy green industry in the UK. And they have de developed, they have a technology which um, will be familiar with many of you in the UAE, but uh, is, is of growing importance in uh, developed economies like the UK and the US. Uh, this uses over 90% less water, uh, produces a product that has three times the shelf life uh, of normal leafy greens, uh, uses no sprays and no fertilizers, uh, and it, it is a, a product that can compete in terms of taste and, uh, and quality with anything that's grown uh, in more conventional circumstances. Its problem, its problem is power, is electricity. It's very uh, expensive in electricity terms to produce, but they've cracked this now with the use of renewables. And I think that this is an area where the UAE and the UK can work very closely together. You have access to extraordinary uh, quantities of renewable uh, energy, not just solar, but through other means as well. Uh, and I think that the, this kind of technology can completely change the way we are producing food, producing it look closer to home. Interesting, I know that Sainsbury's are very committed to this. It'd be interesting to hear from Claire uh, what their 
work is uh, what work they're doing in this field. Uh, Najla talked about change makers. Well, change makers are going to change the way we uh, eat, the way we get food for, uh, to our plate, and how we treat waste. Um, and sometimes the clunky uh, supply chain that we've existed with for too long needs this kind of disruption. And uh, we're looking to you uh, to help us in, in achieving that. Uh, you're doing much of this, and we respect that. But we are very mindful of the fragility of our supply chain, as has been proved by COVID. Uh, and we want to make sure that we are uh, working with uh, regions of the world and innovative companies that are going to be the path to addressing these problems, these absolutely massive problems. Thank you for the chance of sharing this with you. I look forward to hearing from, the, from other speakers and answering any questions later. Richard, thank you so much. Um, and I hope that at some point this year, together with Najla Khalid, Dr. Esam, and the rest of the council, we can organize something to bring these kind of innovators and entrepreneurs together between the UK and the UAE. Thank you. Um, now, moving to our last but not least, our final keynote, um, Dr. Esam. Dr. Esam is head of food trade control section of the food safety department in Dubai municipality and a member of the UAE Food Bank Committee. Dr. Isam, are you with us? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Amar. And thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to participate in this uh, event. Uh, I would like to share with you uh, an initiative that we make that in Dubai to reduce their food loss. So uh, I will try to go very quickly in this presentation. I hope you are able to uh, see the uh, presentation. So in Dubai, uh, as it's known, uh, we are uh, totally depending on imported food. So uh, every year we import almost uh, 8 million tons of food are uh, imported through our borders, uh, Dubai. And uh, in 2015, we noticed that almost uh, 16,900 tons of food are extracted or rejected in the borders because of many reasons. Because of the documentation, let's say, certificates, halal certificates, uh, health certificates, sometimes unfit samples. When we take samples, the, the food shipments are not complying with our standard, or sometimes uh, physically unsatisfactory, so or it's spoiled. So these are the reasons uh, we uh, reject the food from the borders, and this increases the food loss. So we started to see the challenges of this uh, uh, problem. We saw that the, the food are not complying with the regula uh, regulation, lack of awareness of the exporter, uh, lack of the awareness of the importer who are in Dubai, and they are not aware about the regulation of the uh, uh, labeling or documentation. There's no alternative solution for the landfill. So this all foods where goes every time to the landfills, and then we don't have very clear legislation for the uh, alternative solutions for the uh, food which is not complying with the regulation and limited number of their second companies. So we started to see our procedure, internal procedure, uh, how we can solve this problem. We started to analyze the data and we started to, to put the solution. So in 2015, it was 16,000 tons of uh, food were wasted going to the landfill, then reduced to the 13,000 ton, then 3,000 ton, then 1,000 ton, then one ton. So we reduced this the full amount of the uh, reduction. Uh, we reduced the food loss from 16,000 ton to almost one ton. And in 2020, it was almost 500 kg. So what would uh, what did we do? It's a very simple solution. And uh, it was, I think it was a very new to Dubai at that time. So we started to uh, direct the food which is not meeting our requirement for the documentation only so we took it to the ue food bank uh, which is not meeting with the uh, physically unsatisfied it goes for the cell recycling and which is also uh, not meeting with the documentation only halal so for example the shipment is not halal uh, we uh, directed to the animal farms so it is uh, very simple solutions we try to uh, solve this problem uh, with co uh, collaboration with these all uh, entities. Uh, in 2019, it was 2,000 ton 
uh, in 2019, it was 6,000 ton of food being directed to the uh, alternative solutions. And in 2020, uh, it was almost uh, 13,000 of ton being directed to this, this three uh, solutions. Still, it's a big problem uh, because I talk only about the importation, imported food, but still we have a big challenge at the level of the persons, uh, individuals, uh, retailers, uh, hotels, still it's a big challenge that we are facing and we are now currently we started to put uh, another solutions to solve these problems uh, almost if you can say here per day we have almost 8000 ton of food uh, are uh, going to the landfill and 30 percent of of this food are or, or of this waste are uh, organic waste so uh, this is very briefly about our initiative and uh, we are here uh, ready to hear about from you uh, any innovation and any solution that you think it can uh, be a part of uh, solving the challenge that we're having in the, uh, let's say, in the uh, at the individual uh, level. We have some programs, we have some uh, initiative uh, awareness programs, but still it is a big challenge and it should be solved as been mentioned by the previous uh, speaker. Thank you very much. Dr. Sam, thank you so much. And I, I know personally how forward thinking and innovative Dubai is with the number of programs they run to help entrepreneurs access government frameworks and implement solutions. I think a couple of our speakers have been through that. And um, so we'll get to hear more from them. But thank you to all our keynote speakers so far. Please stay with us um, and enjoy the rest of the webinar. I am now going to hand over to Ray, Ray Gibbs. Um, he sent me a couple of buyers for him, but he did say something about milk farms, which I can't find. Uh, but Ray uh, is chairman of Joint Working Group on Implementation of Graphene standardiz Standardization between the UK and China in conjunction with the UK BSI and the Standards Administration Office of China. Uh, now commercializing advanced materials at Manchester University, developing a world first ecosystem, offering commercial scale up and a full business support structure. Ray, I'll hand over to you uh, for our panels and thank you. Thank you, Omar. Uh, yes, I did actually run a, the dairy uh, cheese, cheese business dairy group for five years, but uh, that's history. Uh, it did give me an insight into food manufacturing massively, which is uh, pretty important. Uh, I'd like to introduce Claire Hughes from Sainsbury's PLC and Martin Wickham from the Department for International Trade, who are going to be my panel guests on the first part of what has already been a scene setting experience of, uh, of uh, quite a lot of issues associated. Claire is formerly 12 years of Marks and Spencer. Uh, head of as a head of food technology moved four years ago to the food retailer Sainsbury then head of quality and innovation and now for the last nine months has been director of product and innovation and Martin is food and drink investment specialist for the UK government department for international trade and his role is to increase foreign direct investment by developing world-class R&D and business opportunities in the UK's food and drink sector. And I'd like to start, Claire, with you, <laughs> if that's okay. Okay, that's great. And well, thank you for having me today. That's well, welcome, welcome. We're running slightly behind time, but that's not a problem. I'd like to start with really looking at Sainsbury's as a group and, and how you see your work, particularly in the ESG, the Environmental, Social and Government sector, which is a key platform of Sainsbury's developments. Yeah, we had our first ESG day this year. Um, on the 17th of June um, and we had over 100 investors actually attended that. We did it virtually, I think that worked quite well as you'd probably expect us to do. And then actually in the afternoon sessions we had uh, breakouts so that the investors were able to ask us quite more specific detailed um, questions. So we had a net zero plan, we've still got a net zero plan but we've um, sort of repositioned it as plan for better. And under that plan, we would have better for you. So all about a drive to healthy and sustainable diets, which links really well into the national food strategy in the UK, um, better for the planet and um, reduce carbon emissions as part of that. So we have, um, we've got a target to be net zero by 2040, and we've got another target to um, reduce our scope three emissions by 20, by 30%, um, minimize use of water, increase recycling, um, reduce 
food waste. So our target in food waste is reduce food waste by 50% by 2030. Um, and then on sustainability, sustainable sourcing and biodiversity as well um, to get a net positive impact on our operations on biodiversity. Um, and that's probably the, the uh, pillar that's least scoped at the moment. That's good. Um, so where do you see the future of food going then in terms of retailing, Claire? Obviously, sustainability is right up there amongst everything in, in bright neon lights, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I think sustainability has to be part of everybody's agenda, no matter what the business are. Um, mm -hmm. it, not only from an investment point of view, but also it's extremely important to customers. I don't think customers understand it all, but that's not a reason for not doing it and what we have to do is take customers on that journey with us um, and help them or give them or actually you know uh, we do the work for them so that their diet and becomes more sustainable as well from the products that they buy for us um, I think it'd be interesting um, on where we go in areas such as um, health actually where that ends up in the, the future and, and we've seen quite a large um, drive in plant-based foods in some areas, so particularly in dairy. So plant-based milks has grown massively in the UK. Um, we've seen incredible growth, not so much, uh, and quite high growth in other areas outside of that. Um, but I think for the sort of sustainability point of view, it's more how we, we, we shouldn't tell people they can't eat foods, it's how we help them balance the diet. So there'll be lots in the food space, lots of innovation needed actually in the supply chain um, to help reduce emissions. How do we produce more efficiently? How do we waste less? And, and I'll come on to talk a bit about uh, food waste. Um, and I think there'll be at some point where we'll reach a tipping point in plastic, plastic packaging. That, that's one of the, that's one of the pillar that I actually look after for Sainsbury's directly. Um, it's extremely functional in products, but we know we need to reduce our use of plastic. So we've got loads of work to do in that and find new raw materials um, and collaborate with others to draw on these issues because this isn't a Sainsbury's only um, issue that we have to do. So we have to be collaborating globally. Our suppliers are global um, are globally based as well. So how do we work together, share learnings, share ways to innovate and invest together on new technologies. So one of the things then would be to make sure that the wrapper or the coatings for food uh, better keeps oxygen out of the food to avoid degradation, which is a massive issue in the food industry retailing wise, I guess. Um, yes and no, it depends on the product. I think um, plastic's actually brilliant. So plastic's really efficient and we've got some um, uh, ways of doing that in areas with shorter shelf life and in, in produce. Mm. Um, I think there's a fine balance with the customers between food that they would expect to be fresh um, and what fresh means to them um, and how long, long you can um, keep the product in the shelf. Uh, and that's the debate we have constantly around freshness and quality um, and how you maximise both quality and freshness and get a longer shelf life. And you can do that in a number of ways. Um, there's lots of ways in produce um, that just by adding, um, by using different packaging, so um, perforated packaging, where you let more air flow, flow in, which, which protects the product and gives it a longer shelf life. Um, and looking at more, uh, looking at products as well about uh, um, uh, frozen and how do we do a better job with customers on frozen food, albeit actually the energy costs of um, in frozen food is higher, but how do we do uh, frozen food and um, products that we sell in canned, how do we maximise those areas as well? Um, and if we're thinking about um, what the work we do in packaging, we would never reduce the packaging in a product that would impact um, on the, the life of that product, the shelf life. Um, we would be working in our supply base right through the supply chain, actually, um, around maximising life at every stage and, and, and reducing food waste where we can. Uh, so we, we tend to, um, we've got a series of measures, actually, when we're looking at projects, projects and if, if one of them was to achieve a packet packaging reduction, um, but it reduced the waste of the product, we, we, we increased waste of the product, we wouldn't launch it. I think the shelf life is quite an interesting um, area to, to 
consider and i know that there are some businesses now looking at electronic shelf labels that bring uh, produce that is approaching its end of use to bring it to the consumer's attention and if they are there there's a discount associated with that as a means of not throwing it away but getting the the consumer to buy as an education process there as well but but to actually get them to buy that product which means more revenue for the retailers and less food waste are you seeing that in in your sphere yeah we've been i think we've done some trials with electronic food tables but i think sort of a technology-led solutions will help revolutionize this this whole area actually um because quite a lot of those reductions at the moment are done quite manually um and my whole time in retail there's a lot of discussions Correct. about uh, yeah manual manual reductions i think one of our but well, we would try and decrease operational surplus when it's coming into the food supply chain anyway um where we do have food waste uh, we look to um, redistribute it through charity through our charity partners which we have mm -hmm. a number of and um, so we've worked with neighborly um uh, fair share and we make sure that um depending on what's the best location for the store then as much food as possible get goes to a human mouth there's a challenge around that around what you can redistribute um because it's so uh, close to the end of life and then the other area is animal feed um, so it'd be more important firstly to give it to a human um, but but what can we use um, for animal feed and, and there's lots of um, within the supply base of leftover bits of bread from making sandwiches um, going into um, animal feed because it, it's really good uh, um, really good it's got it's got value there actually um but yeah i think um electronic sh shelf labels and how we get digitalized this will be the future people talk about the iot and digitalization i agree with that and i'd like to introduce martin wickham who's been patiently waiting to be brought into this conversation and thank him for his patience and he's still there which is good um Mar martin i i want to just move the switch from the retailing end to the food manufacturing end because that's also an area where I think education technology and other things can help greatly. What's your view on the food man? I've been in the food manufacturing side of 24,000 tons of hard cheese every year. So I know, I know how difficult this is, but what's your view on the food manufacturing initiatives that can be brought to bear? That's a, a really good question. And there's lots of um, very complex answers to that, that we could give to that question. I mean, um, I'm just going to give you one, one fairly short answer in, in the context of food waste. I mean, when we look at food waste, as we heard from um, the, um, one of our speakers this morning, that there's around about 1.3 billion tons of food wasted worldwide. I mean, this is a huge quantity of, of waste, uh, which has a, a, a total annual cost to the global economy of somewhere in a, about a trillion dollars. So it's a huge waste. But when we tend to look at food waste and think about food waste, we tend to automatically switch to uh, and start thinking about the food waste that we, we, we produce in our home. But actually, there is another side to this, and that's the food waste that's produced by industry. And I think that this is where we can make big strides forward at, at the moment. I mean, we have we, we manufacture a lot of food and during that manufacturing process, there is a number of um, waste streams that are produced. Now, historically, um, we have um, been fairly low in innovation in terms of those waste streams. Um, but if we want to implement a, a circular economy, there's a number of strategies that we can adopt. One is reduce those waste streams entirely um, or eliminate them entirely. And another one is finding a more sustainable solution in managing those waste streams. Um, food manufacturing comprises of a number of complex processes. And so there's a large, generates a vast amount of, of food waste, but there's actually a lot of complex materials in those food waste, which we can um, create value from. Like I said, historically, the way we've been dealing with these is, is fairly low economic and, and has an environmental value. For instance, we've been using them for animal feeds, um, anaerobic digestion, composting, incineration, land spreading, land filling. But like I said, food waste contains numerous chemicals that have a wide range of potential commercial applications. And within this area, there's a lot of very small um, startup businesses that are making um, real real impact in this area. 
there's a real symbiosis in, in, in valorizing these waste streams uh, for the food industry. Um, and it's going in a, in a number of different directions. Um, I mean, some of the more um, some of the food waste streams we can actually push back into the food um, food food system, and and they can actually be used for foods for um, again for humans, not just going to animals. But there's more innovative products that are coming onto the market. I mean, just to give you two that that, that I've come across recently, there's there's a. a, a a compound called carbon quantum dots, which is sounds very complex, but these are very small carbon nanoparticles around about 10 uh, nanometers in size that um, can be used, that can be collected and manufactured from food waste streams and are being done by a number of uh, small companies around Europe and around the rest of the world. And these um, quantum dots, carbon quantum dot technology can actually be used for food additive detect uh, detection in terms of heavy metal ions, detection of pathogens, they're actually being used to detect and then remove harmful substances in, in the food industry. Now, um, we've just heard about plastics and how plastics are important, but again, waste streams are now being used to actually manufacture plastics. So um, there's, there's compounds called PHAs, which are polyhydroxyl alkanates. Um, they're essentially a polyester that's produced by nature. And we can use microbes, uh, bacteria, and, and uh, other, other organisms to actually produce bioplastics from these PHAs. And these are now being used to produce bioplastics. The benefit of these bioplastics are that they're fully degradable. Um, and so not only are we reducing food waste, but we've also got a sustainable um, um, a solution to that particular problem. So I think the short answer to, this, to your question is that we have these waste streams. They are at the moment um, environmentally bad but they have a very potentially economic value that we can we can uh, we can tap into um, so i think that that's a, a good way that the industry can can have an impact in this space thank you martin that's really good um and, and i actually know of a couple of initiatives in in my work that uh, is using laser technology to uh, convert plastics to a carbon-based material called graphene and graphite which in itself is pretty novel and unique and there's an Israeli company doing that already at the moment which I think uh, industry needs to look at. Claire can I come back to you on the on the food manufacturing I know from experience that the retailers audit everyone uh, in the food chain from the farm to the paddock to the farm to everywhere how do how do you look at the manufacturing process in in industry from a food waste perspective if Jesus, is that part of the audit process that you, you adopt? Um, it, I'd say it's more, it should be more part of the um, the day to day work of the food technologists and the, um, the sort of, of teams that are on those sites. Um, the suppliers um, are actually on it themselves uh, because um, there's, there's quite low margins actually in, in some areas from a commercial perspective. So it's in their interest actually to, to really reduce food waste. And there's many sort of projects we'll be looking at at the moment to say, um, is there, uh, if you look at meat or if you look at chicken and what part of the chicken the customers like to eat, um, is there anything we can do with the other parts of those chicken that, that creates value? So they'll, they'll be doing that um, quite naturally through. And then we have a process at um, Sainsbury's called value chain analysis that we would take for with our suppliers. And we would look at the end-to-end -end process completely. Um, and we would have a couple of suppliers on that. We've worked on food waste specifically with the IGD as well. Um, and we're encouraging our um, suppliers to add to to um, to sign up to Champions 12.3 for um, from a UK perspective. And what we would do in a value chain analysis is look at right through every step from processing, from intake of raw materials, and we would look at waste and, and where they're producing too much product. And sometimes they're producing too much product because our orders maybe don't come in in the right way for them. So there's quite a lot of stuff that we would just naturally look at efficiencies in that and, and sort of let's look at can you order every two days um what's the shopping profile for customers in store when's the best time to get that product and so all that stuff would be mapped and that would have been similar actually my experience at MS before i came to sainsbury's but yeah massively complex but can help create value and efficiency and make that supply chain um, more economically viable as well 
We'll be looking at this, the fish industry with uh, Sean Dennis uh, uh, in a later panel session. So thank you very much for that plug. I'm sure he'd be delighted with that. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> thank you. Um, Martin, you spent, uh, I'm not going to embarrass you by how many years you've been in the food in the beverage industry, but where do you see the trends? I mean, you've been in a, a long time. Where, where are you, how do you see the trends mapping out, given that the, the UN want to achieve zero hunger by 2030, for example, and one tonne of food waste can pre prevent it, can save about 2.5 tonnes of CO2. So it's a serious issue. Um, where do you see the trends going in, 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 in your, from your view, given all the, all the uh, hours and days and weeks and years that you've been in, in this industry? Um, before I answer that question, I think it's probably best if I take a look back. I mean, I, it has, I have been working in the industry for many, many, many years. Um, uh, I'm, I'm much younger than I actually look. Uh, sorry, I look much younger than I actually am. Um, but... Um, you know, what, if you look back at publications from 25 years ago and you, you look at um, what they were, when they were talking about food stain, sustainability, you see a very different um, conversation to what you're seeing nowadays. Um, in terms of food sustainability, around about the 80s, when I was very much starting out my career, it was all around security of the food supply chain and the health, safety, affordability and quality, making sure that we get products that are safe to the consumer. Now, food sustainability has a completely different meaning, um, and so there's and so the biggest change that I've seen in in that time is is a a, a change in mindset um, from the individuals, right from the consumers, um, right across industry and even into policy, etc. Um, and that and that that meaning of food sustainability now is very much around the environment um, and the impact that food manufacturing supply and consumption has on, on environmental sustainability. And we hear a lot of things about um, um, greenhouse gases, um, nitrogen water cycles, impact on biodiversity, et cetera. So probably the short answer is, is that, that um, the change that I've seen and the change that I've continued to, li like, to, to um, like to uh, see is, is this change in, in thinking in the way we are. Now, what's driving this? That's a really good question. But actually, what we've seen this, we've seen this snowball and, and really we've seen this explosion, uh, especially within the UK, in the last two to three years of, of public interest in food sustainability, um, not just food waste, and but also plastics that we've heard about um, from Claire. Uh, and really, that's been driven by, has been, well, it's been put under the spotlight by a, a number of celebrities, um, uh, input from NGOs, and also contributions from public bodies such as DEFRA. So I think what we're seeing is that uh, food sustainability is, is, is rightly so becoming an issue, or at least a topic of conversation and action right across the spectrum of stakeholders. It's not just coming from the consumers. It's not just coming from the industry. It's not just co coming from the policymakers, but it's coming from all aspects. And, and so moving forward, I think that what we'll see is a very different um, environment in terms of our food system, our food consumption, the way we um, manufacture our food, the way we transport our food, the way we consume our food, and the way we deal with our waste. I think that very rapidly, and we're talking about you know, only five to 10 years, probably not even 10 years, maybe just five years, we'll see this change. So I think that if we look back at the food systems and the food environment where we were 25 years ago, it's probably unrecognizable to where we are now. But if we look forward to five years time with all the innovation that's coming across and all this um, um, input from all the different stakeholders, I think that the food industry or the food system in, in five years time will look very different to how it is today. Thank you, Martin. Um, we've got five minutes to get to go, and I wanted just to bring in one other topic for me, and it involves something I've worked with and I've been involved with for 10 years, and that's graphene in terms of its barrier properties. We talked about uh, food in terms of avoid, avoiding um, difficulties with, and you mentioned putting air, air, air into products, and I get that totally, but where you want something that's in a in, a, in an inert environment, a barrier film that creates that. And I, I know there's chat in the line about Barrex. Uh, graphene itself has a fantastic ability to do that. And that's an advanced material. Maybe, Martin, that's where advanced materials comes into play in all of this process. You've got the IoT, the, the uh, Industrial 4.0, 4, 4 and so on and so forth. 
final comment from Claire. Is there anything else you want to add before we, we wrap up, Claire? It's been fascinating so far. Lots of, I've, I've made so many notes, I don't know quite know where to go, actually. <laughs> I think the final point I would make was, is just around collaboration, actually, and how and the importance of that. Because I know, and you've just mentioned graphing, and you mentioned it to me when we talked. I know there's a lot of technology that's sitting, waiting to be exploited, but sometimes retailers don't know about it, or it yeah. might come, it, it might be closed off before it gets to us. Um, and so it's how we create that sort of open dialogue um, with ourselves, with others, with our suppliers together. Um, so that we can work on projects, because some of these things cost a lot, but if we do them at scale, we can reduce the cost. Um, so yeah, keep, keep talking, sharing, and um, bringing ideas forward. We will do, trust me. Martin, anything else from you before we, we finish our, our session? Um, for me, it's probably coming back to food waste. I mean, what we've seen over the last 15 years, well, we, 15 years ago within the UK, we saw a peak in, in food waste. Um, it was well over 35% of, of all food was, was wasted within the UK. Now, over the last 15 years, we've seen that reduce in numbers and, and there's been you know, a 15% reduction, um, at least a 15% reduction just in the last 10 years. Interestingly enough, with COVID, um, we saw we saw a further reduction almost immediately um, straight away when when we went into lockdown in the UK, um, where you know 79% of the population, you know, majority of the population were were really looking at pre-planning their 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 foods, checking what they had in their fridges and cupboards, managing their food at home better, checking use by dates and respond and you know and then using the leftovers much better. Something that we've been very poor at doing in the UK. It's something that's very easy. Now, if we can take our learnings from that um, 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 COVID period and move forward, then I think we can make a real impact on food waste just within our homes. Thank you, Martin. We're going to pick up on the food waste thing. Again, fantastic introduction. Thank you so much to the next panel group uh, because there's some, there's some good things coming out of, out of that. I'm very pleased. Thank you so much for both of you for joining and I appreciate the time and effort you put in. Thank you very much. Thank but you. Ray, can I just say, Ray, just one quick question okay, for sorry, Claire. Yes. For, sorry, for Claire, there's a couple of questions about- Oh, okay, I've, touched, I've, missed, I've missed those. No, no, it's fine. Claire touched on one about collaboration. Uh, two questions here. One, does Sainsbury's have any initiatives in particular in place to kind of access new technology and how do people go about doing that? So if there's a, a new innovation or a new idea, what's kind of the process? And the second question, you, co-published a report I think around 150th anniversary of Sainsbury's and there was a mention in there about the future of food and the supermarket um, and there was a bit in there that says at some point we will go to Sainsbury's or other supermarkets to collect equipment to grow our own meat do you think that will ever happen or and if so when so we're prepared for it I will start actually first with the question about contacting people in Sainsbury's. It's really hard actually, which is why I come to get in contact with the right person in retail. I, I get that actually, which is why quite often I will go and speak um, at different events because I'm happy people come to me directly, never a problem. I can connect you internally. Um, we've got numerous working groups around to deliver that net zero plan. So there's, um, and we, there's, there's ways for us to access funding together so we've got um, some proposals in at the moment where we've got some funding to do some work in fish uh, I've got numerous collaborations in plastic for R&D funding so we're totally up for that but you can come directly to me if you sit in with any technology that you want to talk about um, so I expect to be inundated today and then in the future of foods report it's a it's a it's a good question now at I, that report was tended to um, be quite controversial and push the boundaries. I think there's something in the whole um, the, the whole thing around food and um, I have certainly spent quite a lot of time over the last few weeks talking to people about cultured meat um, and there's lots you could do with that. Um, so we know more people have been interested in growing their own veg at home at the moment um, and um, hydroponics you can grow we're look, looking at them not only for food but the systems you can set up at home quite expensive for um herbs and things so i don't think it's i think it could come um i'm I sort of sit in the the fence about it but if i look at the science and and talk to people around me 
I, I think I could see a world where you do get there and, and, and your products are much more personalised, which would impact on food waste at the same time as um, deal with a, um, other sort of concerns um, consumers have around products. Excellent. So we'll be getting to Sainsbury's to buy our equipment soon then. So, so Thanks, I, Claire. I, I, Claire I, could, I could go on about, uh, actually, I, I was in a seminar not long ago where someone from the from the California was saying I, that they've invented a process that they, they still need to, to sort out. That it's, it actually makes meat from air. Oh, wow. I've not heard that one. Believe it. Um, no, did, did, I, did I see that the um, that Alistair Burt had, a, had his hand up for a question? Nope. No. No. Oh, yeah. right, okay, we'll fine. we'll move on to the next panel. Okay, fine. <laughs> thank that's, you. That's, that's good. That's good. I'd like to thank you again, Claire. Thank you again, Martin. Excellent things. Lots of thought provoking. And I know there's some chats in 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 in, in the uh, chat room as well. Thank you. Okay. So we're moving on then to panel two, which is actually all about using technology. We've talked about technology, um, and and hopefully the our guests are here. Um, so we've got we got first up uh, Ignacio. Ignacio is the managing director of Winnow Solutions. Uh, Ignacio, where are you? Didn't see you. I'm here. Oh, you are. You're in. You're in Spain, aren't you, sir? I think at the moment on on vacation. But thank you very much for your time away. Uh, Ignacio is global head of operations of Winnow. Winnow uh, um, is all about. Uh, he's been involved in food and beverage for quick service restaurants, Michelin star restaurants. He's a sustainability enthusiast. We need many, many more of you, sir, if I may say. Um, and, and he does the right thing for business and for profit and for env environment. And he's Winnow's mission to inspire chefs to use and see that food is too valuable to waste. And we can talk about some of the initiatives that, that Winnow's got. And wel welcome to the panel. We'll come back to you in a second. Thank you. Um, I've got uh, Khalid Al-Haramar, um, Khalid, you're here. Well, welcome, uh, he's CEO of beer, uh, now in his 12th year at the company, he's led the transformation of beer from a waste management business to a sustainability pioneer, operating in a massive range of industries, which if I was to read them all, would be a little bit, we'd be a little bit longer here. Um, but he's really been championing the Middle East's move towards green solutions, and he's been the driving force for the visions of the future, facilitating achievement of several milestones, including the company's expansion into Egypt and Saudi Arabia. Sean Dennis, we've mentioned fish. Sean is co-founder and CEO of Seafood Souk. Um, apart from that, he's a serial entrepreneur. He's been all around the world, done lots of things in Hong Kong, Switzerland, Dubai, USA. Um, and, and, and in Seafoods, in Seafood Souk, it's a technology company building a digital ecosystem. Sean, you can explain a bit more about that when we come back to you in, in, in a minute. Uh, and he's been, he's been heavily involved in that and doing really well. Um, and Dr. Beanish Siddiqui, Barry Beanish, hello. Beanish is uh, CEO of AH Hydrogel. She's a University of Manchester PhD and a material scientist. And, uh, and earlier on, we've, we've heard about the sustainability of supply chain. And as a consequence of some of the things we've been doing with that, Beanish landed a one million pound Innovate UK grant to develop vertical farming systems using a unique food-based polymer hydrogel uh, and also taking advanced materials um, to, to remote monitoring and cost reduction of, of production. So those are our four, our four, our four panelists. I'd like to start with Khalid. Khalid, 38% um, of food is wasted in the, U, in the UAE. We've heard about that. It's, it's a massive issue. And you've got a waste management center. Could you sort of elaborate on some of the initiatives you've been making on organic food waste and the recycling of plastics, please? Sure. Good. Uh, good morning. And good afternoon, everyone. First of all, pleasure to be here uh, and talk about uh, food waste in this webinar. Uh, so maybe just first, just to talk about you know what BIA does. You know, BIA has been yeah. around just for over 12 years, and it was set up to tackle the problem of waste. You know, the UAE and the region is is known to be uh, one of the largest generators of waste per capita. So this was an immediate problem that BIA addressed from the start. Now today, BIA has become a group company. We we cover different sectors, but we started with looking at how do we solve the problem uh, of waste. Uh, and as you mentioned, you know, in the UAE, 
uh, up to or 38 percent of food is is wasted and and when it comes to the month of ramadan it goes up to even 60 percent so this was an immediate problem so we build the infrastructure today the uh, we we have we are the only fully integrated waste management company so so we don't just treat the waste uh, we also collect the waste uh, we manage landfills and now we are building uh, or completing the construction this year of the first uh, waste to energy plant um, uh, in the region. So, uh, so we operate all over the UAE. We also operate in Saudi and, all, and in Egypt uh, recently. Uh, so we collect all types of waste and we treat all types of waste. Uh, so at our waste management complex, which is located in the Emirate of Sharjah, it's a four kilometer uh, plot where all our facilities are located. So one of the facilities is a material recovery facility, which is the largest in the Middle East. So all the municipal solid waste enters this facility and it's th segregated through a mechanical process. We also have a tar recycling facility, industrial wastewater uh, treatment facility. We have a construction and demolition waste uh, recycling facility and so on. We have a total of nine different facilities today and, and by next year, there'll be 13. Where, where today we've achieved a diversion rate away from landfill of 76%, which is the highest in the Middle East. And once our waste to energy plant is commissioned uh, later this year, we will be close to hitting zero waste to landfill. So this we've been working on this for the last uh, uh, 12 years. Uh, and uh, uh, the, you know, what, what, the United Nations, one of their sustainability goals is to have food waste by 2030. So the UAE is also committed to that target. And uh, food that is waste, uh, food that is disposed in, in landfills also becomes a, ma a major hazard because that's one of the main sources of, of uh, methane. So, uh, so this is what today, what we do with the food waste is uh, we have a compost plant. Uh, so within our waste management complex, one of the facility is a compost plant where we process uh, organic and vegetation waste and, and the compost then is used uh, and converted to fertilizer. So this is just in general, but today uh, as a group, we, we, are, we are also looking at when I reach zero waste towards the end of the year, landfill, how can I repurpose the landfill? So that project is gonna be a solar landfill project, which will, which, which will be, uh, that landfill will be repurposed, will, gen will generate 120 megawatts of power. Uh, we're also, uh, also, what we feel is very strong and is very uh, also relevant to this panel is BIA in the last six years it started focusing more on technology and digitalization. So we've made it two of our core pillars today is sustainability and digitalization. Because for modern economies, these we feel have to go hand in hand. So we've been invested a lot in this area from, from tracking our vehicles, the route optimization, using AI to do that, uh, in addition to we have a contract for with the Ministry of Health for track and, and trace of all medicine in the UAE. Uh, and we've, we've done a lot of initiatives, including uh, we've created a marketplace for uh, trading commodities, recyclable commodities. So this is, uh, we started that this year. We've also Uberized waste collection. We have a platform now where you can collect waste using a, a, an app. Uh, so, and our headquarters that, that we will be delivered later this year designed by the late Zaha Hadid, will be one of the most sustainable as well as one of the smartest buildings in the region. So that's uh, fully powered by renewables, platinum certified, uh, as well as it's the first building in the region which will fully be AI integrated. So that just reflects our DNA of being sustainable and digital. So this is just in general what, what we've been looking at and we're looking at to replicating all that we do here in the UAE in Saudi. In Saudi, we operate in Medina, one of the holy sites. So we have we help we we manage the waste for the whole city. We have three thousand people in Medina, and in Egypt we just started recently with a new project, the new administrative capital. So that's where the new capital of, of Egypt will be. Uh, it's a city that will have up to six million people. So we just started there, and with a target of reaching eighty waste eighty percent diversion. Well, that's fantastic. Uh, uh, and you mentioned, and everyone's been mentioning AI and, and digitalization. And I'd like to bring in one of the key elements of this, which is Winnow Systems and Ignacio. Ignacio, are you there? I'm here, yeah. Can you just talk about how the AI technology works in Winnow? And if you can't, then don't. But I'd like to know a little bit more about how you've done that, how you develop it, and what barriers you've had to get this into the marketplace, because you've now reached 
40 countries in the in the world yep. with this technology. Is that right? Correct. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Just expand upon that for us a bit, because that, that's one of the key aspects of getting things in the market, education and getting people to adopt. Over to you. Great. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you, everyone. And it's a huge pleasure to be here. As you said, I'm, I'm a sustainability enthusiast. Um, it comes from a very early age because I grew up in a very little town uh, where food waste was not an issue. So I, I didn't realize the food waste issue was an issue at all until a later age because in my town, like farmers will knock on your door with a, you know, what they collected on the day and fishermen will do the same. It will be some sort of old, star, old school Amazon Prime uh, with groceries. And um, so we were just consuming what was for the day. Um, but now I'm in Dubai. I am looking after operations for We Know. We Know is a British company um, headquartered in London. But we have offices in Dubai, Singapore, Shanghai, Chicago, and Cluj. And we're now live in 40 countries, as you mentioned. What we do is we basically build artificial intelligence tools to reduce food waste in commercial kitchens. We use um, a version of AI that is called computer vision. And we have a camera that sits on top of our clients' uh, beans and recognizes everything that is being thrown away and takes pictures of it and identifies each and every item or full recipe. So it can, it can recognize tomatoes, but it can also recognize tomato soup, tomato gravy, or a curry, for example, even though even though it's all mixed and, and, and done. And we have a scale underneath that detects the weight. And then those two data entries are matched with cost. And we basically send a report to our clients that said, you've wasted this much, this much, and this much. You need to improve your production on this and this and this. But not only that, we also go a step ahead and step beyond that. And we actually look at efficiencies. So we look at things like, are you actually trimming the salmon the way that you should be trimming it? Is there uh, some inefficiencies on the training of your team because we see a lot of uh, vegetable cuts or maybe you change your supplier and you went with a cheaper uh, fruit uh, producer that is actually delivering you less yield and they're less value for money. So you're actually spending more money on it. So we can actually, you know, like we, we can actually really shine a light on, on, on the food waste issue. And it is, it is, it is great so far. Um, it, it has been a, a difficult journey because food waste, it's interesting. We all know the big figures, right? We know that we waste 30% uh, of what we produce. In fact, food waste is, is a worse environmental uh, issue than uh, plastics, the single-use plastics. Food waste, from a carbon emissions perspective, is three times worse. And we don't talk about it that much. It's still sort of a taboo topic, right? Um, in the hospitality sector, companies waste over 20% of what they purchase, and yet they don't recognize it as an issue. They, they think sometimes that that's already embedded in the PNL. They're already preventing a food cost there that's all mixed. What we're trying to do is actually prove that food waste is a solvable issue and they have financial returns. So actually, as they, I think it was the FAO that said, or, or RAP, I've actually RAP in UK that said that for every euro, that, for every pound that you invest in, in sustainability and in reduction of food waste, you actually get 14 pounds back. So the return of investment, it, it's, it's huge. And we're working with over 1,500 kitchens worldwide, uh, 40 countries, as you mentioned. We're saving $42 million to our clients in food waste every year. And what's more important for me is that we, we're saving over 36 million meals per year from being wasted, right? We, we save, I think it's a meal every, every second and a half right now, or every two seconds. And about 10% of those meals and those savings are actually happening in the UAE. So we have a partnership with the Ministry of Climate Change and Environment, um, and we have what we call the Food Waste Pledge. That is basically an invitation to the to the hospitality sector to reduce food waste, to reduce meals, and we're measuring in the target was to save over three million meals per year by 2020. Obviously, the pandemic kind of got a little bit in the middle, and we were overly achieving that target, but it was not a real picture, right? Because all these reductions that we're seeing now in food waste is just because there's less demand, less less, less uh, travel, less tourism, and, and, and less things happening. But we're on track. Uh, we hit the targets for 2018, 2018, 2020, overly we hit it, but it, it was not, not, not just because of our technology, but we are hitting it in 2021. So we're a very mission-driven company, and we really want to solve this issue for everyone. I'm not sure if that 
answer your question. Sorry, I derailed a little bit. Apologies for that. Ignacio, it, it opens more questions than it, it solves, but thank you for that anyway. Great. I appreciate it. One of the questions I want to come back to, and I will in a minute, is education, because I know Khalid has got a, a, a Department of Education, and I know that you're involved in education, uh, in terms of educating that. And we want to see if we can get this educated into the home kitchens, maybe. That was where an awful lot of waste is going. Before we do that, Sean, you patiently waited. I know Beanie is patiently waiting as well. Let, let's listen to you about how you've taken technology to do something in which we all take probably for granted the supply chain of the fish industry which is what claire alluded to i know there are plenty of issues and you've got and, you, and as you say you've got a suit on today because you're a startup and this is novel for you but let's let's please come on ex explain a bit about what you do because i'm fascinated to hear it go on my sunday best and before i start actually claire i would love to connect with you to chat more on that on some of this to see if we can work together with you would be would be an honor i, I, will, um, I, will, I will connect you no problem Cool, thank you. Um, so Secret Sleep, it's been interesting listening to some of the conversations so far. I think we sit slightly further up the supply chain than most of the, I guess, solutions or focus has been. And seafood, we've all, or most of us have probably seen that documentary that came out not that long ago, Seaspiracy. Mm -hmm. So everyone now has become an armchair expert in the seafood industry, which is great because it's put it to the forefront as to the issues that happen. What they didn't focus on or where they did focus, I guess, was in the illegal, unreported, unregulated IUU fishing and bad fishing practices with nets and the damage it does to the overfishing. Statistics attached to that are not only are we overfishing our oceans, but within the supply chain, once it leaves the fishing grounds or the boats and before it reaches buyers like Sainsbury's, within that supply chain in developing countries, the average wastage or loss is about 40, 45%. And in developed countries can be around 25%. So that's before we've even got to the stage that we've focused on thus far in this webinar. Um, that's disgusting. With all the technology and the processes that we have, and we're still losing nearly half of the fish, and fish being such an important product, one from an income perspective for developing nations, but also from a health perspective and the sensitivity, yeah, sensitivity of the product. It's probably the most highly valuable, highly perishable item that's traded globally that we consume. And therefore really important to make sure that that product arrives in the condition that it left the fisheries. We're doing um, a project with Oman at the moment where we identified the tuna, for example, and a lot of the fish exits the water, or by the, when at first it's caught in its grade A, by the time it reaches the border, even just with the UAE, which is a four hour drive in some cases, it can only be classified as grade C and good for canning. That's because there are multiple, in the case of Oman, average about five or six unnecessary steps in the value chain or the supply chain, where it's being sold to distributor, to trader, to distributor, to trader. Seafood soup through use of a marketplace and in effect, our front or customer facing window is the marketplace, but what actually happens behind closed doors is an efficient or digitized supply chain that provides traceability of that supply chain. We eliminate the need for all those unnecessary steps in the supply chain, thus reducing cost of the product to the end consumer, increasing freshness and shelf life, which if we're talking about fresh, average to seven, seven to 14 day shelf life. If I can give you an extra 20 to 25% shelf life as a restaurant who may or may not lose a booking tonight, for example, that's a massive amount of food products they won't have to throw away because they can use it still tomorrow, for example. Um, in addition to that, uh, the cost associated with providing traceability, and I think there's a lot of traceability plays out on the market, but they're always a value added solution to the actual product. Through using Seafood Soup as the marketplace front window and the transaction and or full supply chain oversight occurring within, let's call it our ecosphere, traceability can provide, be provided to the consumer or the buyer at little to at no extra cost because it's inherent in the business model. So when we're having conversations on sustainability, traceability should know where our product comes from avoiding baiting and switching, which is what occurs in many cases now as well when you do buy from legacy distribution models. 
that shouldn't be a cost that needs to be passed down to the consumer. Buyers or business buyers shouldn't have to pay extra money to know that they are actually getting the product that they're paying for. And that's where, again, we provide that solution. And I think my, I mean, my favorite phrase to summarize it is, traceability is the precursor to sustainability. With traceability, we bring, wow, this is a really cheesy way of saying it, but bring light to an otherwise very opaque industry that is seafood, that Seaspiracy highlighted heavily, and which cannot function with platforms like ourselves or with supply chains that have been digitized and provide traceability. IUU phishing cannot occur or cannot trade when trade is done through a trace traceable or digitized platform. So you are out to revolutionize the industry then, sir, as I understand it. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Talking of, talking of revolutionizing industry, Beanish. Um, Beanish has been involved in creating a revolutionary food grade polymer for hydroponically growing um, plant-based products. And um, I know that there was some... Um, I think um, he's left actually, there's a company called Grow Up which is using vertical farming of leafy greens. Can, can you just explain to, to the audience um, a number, so, so many questions I've got for you, but uh, I'll, I'll keep them as simple as I can. What, one of which is, why did you choose this process to, to do vertical farming and what impact do you think is going to happen uh, for what, what, what you're, going, you're going to achieve across the piece in sustainability? And we can talk about Coir and, 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 and the other things called Pete as well. Over to you. Okay, thanks. Uh, first of all, thanks uh, for inviting me. And uh, good afternoon and uh, good afternoon and morning to all of you. So the reason I went through the process, I will be very honest uh, with all of you. So my background wasn't in indoor farming, uh, things like that. I did my PhD undergrad degrees in chemistry, material science, and it was more research based. But then when after finishing my PhD, then I realized like, uh, there is like when we do research in academia, I mean, not all of them, but it's quite difficult to te take technology uh, from lab uh, to commercial setting and things like that. And then uh, I decided uh, at that point, I decided like uh, how to do research that will benefit our future generation. So not only uh, benefit for us, so it's for sustainability, that was the key. Uh, I think uh, most of us do care about sustainability. So for me, it was the same uh, thing. So in indoor farming, I catch my interest uh, because that was uh, the thing. I mean, obviously, because of now, most of the population uh, from villages, they are moving uh, to cities. So for example, myself, I'm originally uh, from Kashmir, uh, and it's just like, it's more agri. Uh, it was uh, the city I am from, firstly, it was really agri-based uh, uh, city. And even my grandparents, uh, they used to grow like uh, weed crops. But step by step now, for example, my dad, when he came, so they are moving away from uh, traditional agriculture and they are moving uh, more like in industry and things like that. Here in UK, anyone in uh, Europe, when I heard about indoor farming, uh, to be honest with you, unfortunately, not like 10 years ago, I heard and I saw about this technology like uh, back in like literally five years ago. And then I started reading about it and I found a gap, like indoor farming is a great solution. It reduces uh, food mileage and lots of other things. But uh, the key issue, with indoor farming are still, uh, because if you want to make it sustainable, there are uh, obviously there are a number of issues, but I will just focus on sustainable uh, one. So one of the issue is, um, when you grow plants, for example, you need, so instead of probably lots of you are not aware of indoor farming, when you grow crops in indoor farming, you don't use soil. Instead of soil, you use certain uh, substrate to support plant structure. And the issue with the current substrate, for example, peat or rock wool, uh, they are basically, they are not sustainable. Peat is most likely to ban uh, in UK, probably in 2024, uh, definitely by 2020. 
30, but if we will bring our product, it will be, uh, but then this is the major uh, issue with indoor farming. And uh, the second thing is like, there are some alternative uh, product, but supply chain is not really good. So at that point, because my research was more in medical field, then what I realized, what if we take that substrate, uh, if we replace the traditional sub substrate with more uh, environment friendly substrate. So I have developed uh, uh, hydrogel. And now uh, the idea is like, because this hydrogel substrate is more based on environment friendly uh, components, food based as Ray already mentioned. So it will increase uh, the crop yield, but the most important thing is it's recyclable. For example, the rock wool, uh, we are using in uh, rock wool as it's rock. So what is happening? Uh, if you go in indoor farming, lots of indoor farmers, they do use rock wool. And what is happening once they are done growing up plants, there are lots of piles of rock wool. And uh, obviously it's rock, it will stay over there for millions of years. So it will increase the greenhouse gas emissions and things like that. But with our substrate, what will happen uh, after using in indoor farming, then you can literally um, put in soil and in soil it will increase the fertility of soil it will reduce uh, it will not only increase the fertility of soil but it will also reduce the water uh, usage by traditional farmers so this is a sustainable solution so in short terms the reason I mean I came into this field was like the sustainability and to make sure that like the way we are growing in crops in indoor farming it's more like sustainable so Ray if I miss something you could you can highlight it and then I'll just come um, I think there's other things, isn't there? There's use of Coca-Cola and, and, and that, which is also becoming a, a, a big issue. For me as well, though, I, I do believe, and it's on the retailers and everyone's use is the name of sustainability, but there's an education as to what that means. And I think everyone talks about it, but nobody really, uh, the general public don't really understand what it actually means. So it comes down to education. Can I bring in Khalid again on education? Because I know you've been in Beer doing quite a lot of work and, and along with you, Ignatio, as well, on educating the users and the general public. Could you just send a few things about that for me, Khalid, please? Uh, sure. You know, awareness uh, is very important. So, uh, you know, to tackle the problem of food waste and, and general waste, you know, to reduce waste, to recycle waste. Um, so, uh, so we started the BL environment uh, in 2000, and since then uh, we have reached over 250,000 students uh, in the UAE. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, uh, we so this is a program that that, that is not just uh, a physical program; it's also online. We have annual awards, uh, and we get a lot of participation. So. Uh, Part of the problem we have here in the UAE is people don't segregate the waste. So there a lot of awareness still needs to be done. And another challenge we have also in the UAE is the, is the, uh, is the population mix of people from all over the world, different nationalities. Plus many of them are you know, on transit. Some of them would come a few years and leave and so on. So this is, this is a challenge. And so awareness and education is continuous. So we have this program uh, at the school that's been running successfully. I can say, uh, and, and we have started seeing some improvement. Uh, in addition to that, we also, whenever we start, uh, we have started the uh, two stream bins in, in all the residential areas in Sharjah, at least here uh, about also 10 years ago. And we have, we have our team that passes by every single home with an awareness kit in four languages to explain to people why should they segregate, what, what value that will have and so on. Uh, so this is a continuous effort that we have to continue that. And with COVID now, we've switched a lot of this to online. Uh, and, uh, but I do think, you know, what COVID did also for us, people uh, became more aware of the, uh, uh, the challenges when it comes to sustainability and climate change. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and they've taken this more seriously, how keeping communities clean, keeping their cities clean. So it's uh, being more hygiene, uh, taking more. So that, that definitely we feel that there's been some benefit uh, uh, in there. Also for the general public, we have uh, loyalty programs uh, to promote uh, recycling and promote segregation. Uh, uh, so that's something that we do of. 
and we're doing now the same. Uh, we're looking at doing the same in, in Saudi and in Egypt also. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Ignace, a quick word on, on, on education. Yeah, yeah please. I, I love this topic. Um, it was one of the biggest challenges that we have as a company and that we still face. People are not educated on food waste. People don't know the, the size of the issue and people are some sort of de-attached to it. It's, it's like a blame game. It's like you ask retailers, they say that they, they, they actually the people are purchasing want this, this kind of packaging. You go to a restaurant, they say, this is the people. The people say, it's the chef. And then there's always like a, like a vicious cycle going around. As a company who faced this, one of our main goals is actually raising awareness. And one of the things that we do as a company that obviously it doesn't really generate direct revenue for us is a educational projects. So we do things like we go to companies like noon.com, for example, and we talk to them, we give them um, uh, webinars about food waste. What can they do at home? Not through the use of our technology, but actually giving them a better perspective of the issue of food waste. And it's, it's things, for example, when you talk to families and you talk about water consumption, People don't know how much water is put into food and how much water you're actually wasting. When you waste a tomato, there's 30 to 50 liters of water that are going down the drain there because that's what was needed to, to create that tomato, right? And, and we give a lot of examples and we do a lot of this work with organizations, with, uh, with public, with people, in, with everywhere that wants to, everyone that wants to hear about it because it is truly one of the, the, the biggest challenges of our, of our time right now. And it's way bigger than it looks like. And I, and I love that scene also look at the, how they are a little bit above in the, in the food waste hierarchy, right? And how we should be actually preventing. Like transformation is, is great and we need to keep, you know, like, like getting that food and transforming it into something else. But ideally we should prevent that, that food loss and that food waste from happening in the beginning and we should reduce production and we, we should be a bit more um, conscious of the way we produce and the way we consume. And there's another theme that is related to food waste and food loss that people don't talk about that is actually going back to seasonality. We want to eat tuna. One of the problems why we overfishing is because we want to eat fish every day, every year. In, in my house, you don't eat tuna uh, certain times months is just not costume you don't because it's not tuna season if it's not tuna season you don't eat tuna and it should be that way we're losing that and that's contributing to food waste and food loss heavily as well Ignacio, that's brilliant and i'm going to introduce both beanish and sean back in because we're going to talk about tuna for one more minute and i'm literally running out of time and i'm getting um, beaten up by um, omar thank you very much omar but this is a fascinating topic very very important beanish education for the grower in in terms of vertical farming we went didn't we to see a a, a, a very high class um R&D center on, on vertical farming. And they were saying that some of the growers just don't want to change because change is difficult for them to, to do that. Education wise, how do you see that? So for me, I mean, uh, to be honest with you, education wise, it's more like uh, they should the why they don't want to change. So probably I will be slightly off the topic. Why they don't want to change that is the thing. No matter how much educate you, you educate them about sustainability, business, unfortunately, they don't care. Uh, probably big firms, like they do care about sustainability, but small growers, they care more about profit rather than sustainability. So what uh, they think is that the other thing is they don't, with the new technologies, the other issue or barrier, I will say is like, uh, it's if they don't want to change their system. So for example, if they invested uh, in their uh, infrastructure and if there is new technology that is coming into field that is more sustainable, but if it costs them, then they won't adopt uh, it. So for me, education, uh, the way we can educate grower uh, or like change, it, we need to change as a scientist, we need to change as a companies to make sure that the product we are bringing into market fits with the grower needs so that and then it uh, it profit them so that is the way otherwise to be honest with the there are lots of talks lots of and when you talk with people businesses they will be like yes we care about sustainability we care about future generation 
but in actual, they care more about profit and things like that. So the way we can change, yes, we can keep sustainability, but at the same time, we, when we educate them, we need to discuss about how it will benefit their business. So we need to combine these things together, like as a startup or as a, any technology that we are bringing into market. So probably it doesn't like, uh, get, why are you asking? But for me, it needs to be like, uh, Question because it's all about it's all about if you're asking me as a, as a as a manufacturer to change my capital equipment process or something in there that's going to cost me money i'm not going to do it unless there's a massive reason to do that and that's part of the, the issue with the growing circle and i do i do get the sustainability maybe there's a role for the retailers to drive that a little bit, bit yes, harder yeah. and I so, know they're, they're talking about it yes just quickly to add on it so for example we are engaging with certain growers so firstly they were not interested in sustainable product so that is the part of like retailers so one of uh, lots of retailers in uk now they said they will buy products from the grower who are uh, taking care of like who are growing in a sustainable way or things like yes from top if there is a pressure like from retailers then uh, growers will adopt but at the same time cost is major factor for them besides sustainability like for any new technology i agree sean one, one last one from you you've been brilliant at being patient again thank you so much um one thing one thing that occurs to me is that ice and, and packaging of, of fish must take an awful lot of ice to keep fish fresh. So your technology is reducing the use of ice in terms of keeping things fresh and things like that. Is that, is that a fair comment? Yeah, and whilst we're not specifically focused on the hardware, it's more the creation of a more efficient supply chain means there's less of a requirement for continued topping up of the ice. We were actually selected by the United, let me get this right, United Nations Sustainable Decade uh, for, yeah, for, for Ocean, Sustainable Ocean Decade as a case study uh, to showcase the supply chain digitization um, that we're working on and the traceability that it brings or, and the efficiency that it brings as well, which has been pretty interesting. One thing that we do or we are working on, which is pretty interesting, which will limit in some cases, and especially going back to what Ignacio said with the, with the tuna, is working in partnership with IPNLF, which is the International Pole and Line Fishing Association. So that is a type of fishing which eliminates all forms of bycatch. Again, people have seen Sea Spiracy know that that is one of the major reasons for big overfishing. Um, eliminates that and this is a way for fish that are caught especially the majority of our fish comes from developing nations where supply chains may or may not be as they should be and transport can be difficult uh, so then that's the reason why ice has historically been required for higher value products like tuna we've been working with IPNLF to develop a almost like a casing which will wrap around the tuna and give it I guess climate equivalent to the being iced for up to eight to nine hours, which again will stop the requirement for ice throughout that supply chain, um, and as well as enable it to arrive at its destination fresher, which has been pretty interesting. So again, whilst we're not directly focused on ice provision, it is a major issue within the seafood industry and something we're working on helping out with. I think we've been really, Pleasantly surprised, and I guess just to add on what everyone else was saying with the education side, pleasantly surprised by the reaction from the, let's call them the good actors uh, in terms of the suppliers, wanting to be part of the traceability discussion and wanting to put their information and the good, the good that they do and their processes to communicate that with the business buyers. Because historically in the legacy distribution model, a lot of that information was lost because it would just be sold as salmon, or Norwegian salmon, for example, or tuna from Tanzania. Now they're able to say, these are our boats, these are the fishing practices we have, or these are the farms, these are the processes we do, and these are the extra things that we do at night to like, tuck them in and make sure they're good, et cetera, et cetera. And they're proud of doing that. And because that doesn't cost anything extra through our model, it doesn't matter whether the buyers value it or not. They've got pressure from us, the consumers, to start valuing it. And when you get the good buyers who do want to, then, then it's a win-win-win it's for all, all involved, which has been great to see. 
Thank you very much. Omar, I apologise, we're five minutes over. Huge. No, 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 that, that, that was amazing. I think we could do another whole session on this. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for everybody. Um, so much to take away from that. I Just before I hand over to our closing speaker, I just want to say, look, for anybody on this webinar, if you're interested in the UAE in terms of growth or opportunities or anything else, please reach out to the UAE UK Business Council. That's what we're here for. Uh, we will send out an email with all the contact details you need. Uh, we'll be doing a lot more of this, these discussions in the future. And actually, one of our biggest objectives is to support UAE and UK companies growing to respective markets uh, and access and make life a lot easier. But thank you, Ray. Thank you to all our speakers. I now have the pleasure to hand over to our closing speaker. Uh, and he's somebody that I've been a big fan of for a long time. So it's great to have him here. Um, the Right Honourable Alistair Burt. Um, I don't think there's many people that know more about the Middle East um, uh, than Alistair. Um, and great to see him. He is now the chairman of the Emirates Society. Um, I won't steal his thunder. I'll let him tell you more about the Emirates Society and their work. Um, Alistair, over to you. Um, well, thanks very much, uh, Omar. I suspect there's a few million people who know a bit more about the Middle East than me. Um, but it's uh, kind of you to say what you do. Um, I wanted, first of all, on behalf of everyone who's been part of it today, just to express uh, our thanks to all those who've made this really quite memorable morning. Uh, thanks to all the key speakers, too many to pick out individually. But I think particularly to Ray, who's done a great job to hold it all together uh, and to keep the discussion moving. Uh, not that it needed any great, uh, uh, any great assistance. We were talking about things that are, are fundamental to all of us. I, I don't have the same background as Benish and Ignacio in coming from uh, a, a, an environment and a sense where uh, closeness to, to nature and agriculture was key. I grew up in an urban environment in the 1950s and 1960s. But what I can remember is that our waste bin at home was pretty small compared to the two or three sizable waste containers we now have uh, in many homes in the United Kingdom. And I sometimes worry if recycling, which a lot of people have got, is used as an easy substitute for cutting down on waste. Because if you feel you're doing your bit by putting the refuse in the right container, you're not really getting the point about reducing the amount that you're putting in. And I thought the discussion today from all sorts of different quarters, it gave me a sense of the need to, uh, to have a combination of innovation, of technology, of uh, commercial responsibility, public awareness, but also government oversight, because all this won't happen purely by magic and by uh, market forces. And there's got to be some elements there. But ultimately, it's got to be a question of it being worthwhile. Uh, and if people uh, are forgetting that the most important thing that's worthwhile is having a sustainable environment, well, they just have to watch the news uh, all around them at the moment to realize the risks that we're running and to emphasize the importance of food sustainability and the contribution waste can make of that. Well, the time couldn't, uh, couldn't be better to get that message over. I thought there was an awful lot in, in today's uh, seminar, and I know that having been recorded, we'll be able to get it to more people, uh, and I'm sure more people will be interested. I improving that sense of public awareness is going to be absolutely key. The Emirates Society has therefore been really appreciative of being able to partner in relation to this. The Emirates Society is uh, the friendship group between the UAE and the UK, inaugurated by respective foreign ministers uh, a couple of years ago. We are very proud to have the support of Ambassador uh, Mansour Abahul uh, in London, who uh, supports the work that goes on here very strongly, and I hope has been on the call uh, today. And essentially, we look at, at that friendship relationship right across the spectrum, arts, culture, diplomacy, science and technology, uh, defense and security issues, political issues, but also we very much support the commercial relationship, bearing in mind a lot of members of the Emirates Society of people who currently live and work in either place and certainly contain those who have in the past lived and worked in both places. And really the Emirates Society cements the affection 
that we each feel for the other state and the friendships we've made over many years. We have a website, we have a Twitter feed, so do go there if you want further information. We're a very strong supporter of the uh, UAE UK Business Council. I am particularly because with His Excellency Dr. Amar Gargash, we set this up uh, in 2011, all those years ago. Uh, delighted to see it being so strong and being carried on now in so many different ways. And the innovations that we've heard about today emphasize uh, how much that we can still do in the future. Uh, it's a great year looking forward. Uh, Dubai Expo is coming up. We have the celebration of 50 years through National Day and beyond. There's a lot going on between the two states. And I think today just emphasized the importance of that relationship in very, very practical and important issues. And I've been delighted that we've been a part of it. So big thanks to Omar uh, for holding it all together technically, to Ray again for, uh, for managing everyone and to all the speakers who've been so educative. It's been a great morning uh, and I hope more people see it from the recordings to come in the future. Thanks, Omar. Thanks, Alistair. Thank you for that. But, well, that's it. Thank you, everybody. Um, look out. There'll be an email with all the details and the link if you want to watch this again or share it with anybody. Um, thanks, Ray. Thanks, Bradley, Nedjla, all the speakers. Um, and have a great day. Thank you.